Good morning, and welcome to today's Atlanta Council event, Fostering a Fourth Democratic Wave, a playbook for countering the authoritarian threat. My name is Matthew Kranig, and I'm the Senior Director of the Atlanta Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Thank you to those of us joining us here in person at the Atlanta Council Studios, and to those tuning in virtually from around the world. This event celebrates the launch of a new publication jointly produced with the International Center on Nonviolent violent conflict on how to foster a fourth democratic wave. We gather today at a critical moment for global democracy. Democracy is under attack as autocrats grow bolder and more brazen by the day in their attempts to disrupt and displace the rules-based democratic order that's brought freedom, prosperity, and peace to so many around the world. According to Freedom House, last year marked the 17th consecutive year of decline in global freedom, from Russia's war in Ukraine to China's crackdown in Hong Kong to the ruthless actions taken by the dictatorial regimes in Belarus, Venezuela, Syria, and Iran, authoritarians continue to deploy tactics to repress democracy. But the tide may be turning. Recent anti-regime protests in Iran, China, and Belarus show that everyday people are willing to stand up and fight for freedom, and authoritarian gains are not a given. This global struggle between democracy and autocracy sits at the core of our fourth democratic wave project, which aims to fight against authoritarian rule by offering a forward-thinking, actionable blueprint to catalyze support for nonviolent pro-democracy movements and to foster a fourth democratic wave. This project seeks to push back against authoritarianism and bolster democracy at all levels, from empowering civil resistance leaders and nonviolent movements on the ground, to equipping policymakers from the US, Europe, and allied democracies with the tools they need to support global democracy from the top down. In particular, the project's playbook outlines three pillars of strategy for democratic governments to better support and enable pro-democracy movements internationally by first, proposing new approaches and tools to support civil resistance movements, second, advancing a new international norm on the right to assist uh, to pro-democracy movements, uh, and three, developing strategic and tactical options to constrain authoritarian regimes and drive up the cost of repression. This playbook cannot be more timely. Uh, this very week, President Biden is convening the second Summit for Democracy, bringing together leaders from dem democracies worldwide to discuss ways to advance democratic values and defeat authoritarianism. We hope today's event and publication help to advance these goals. This work is central to the Scowcroft Center's mission of developing sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important challenges facing the United States and its allies. The Center also honors the legacy of service of General Brent Scowcroft, and embodies his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge a few people who made the Fourth Democratic Wave project possible. First, I'd like to pay respects to a person who's not with us today, but who played an integral role building the Fourth Democratic Wave project. Uh, Peter Ackerman was the founding chair of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and also an Atlanta Council board member. He was the inspiration for this joint project between our organizations, and Peter helped to drive this effort from the very beginning, and we hope that this project helps to carry forward his important legacy. I'd also like to thank our Fourth Democratic Wave Task Force members, including some of the world's leading democracy experts from government, academia, civil society, and the private sector. They provided invaluable insights and guidance throughout the project and drafting of the playbook. Thank you especially to our task force co-chairs, Derek Mitchell, Lisbeth Pillegaard, and Daniel Twining. I also want to com commend our playbook authors, lead author Hardy Merriman, who is here with us on stage, Patrick Quirk of the International Republican Institute, and Ash Jane of the Atlantic Council for producing such a compelling report and set of policy recommendations. Finally, thank you to our distinguished group of panelists uh, joining us for today's discussion, which will be moderated by Laura Kelly, foreign policy reporter for The Hill. Before I turn to Laura, I want to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record. For our in-person audience, we will take questions at the end of the moderated discussion where you can cue at the microphone or type into the iPad our staff is circulating to pose your questions. For those joining virtually, we invite you to engage with the discussion by submitting questions using the Zoom Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen or through tweeting with the hashtag, hashtag fourth democratic wave. Thank you again for joining the Atlantic Council for what I know will be an enriching discussion. And now I'll turn the floor to our moderator, uh, Laura. Uh, Laura, over to you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming in person. And hello to everyone that's joining us virtually online. I'm Laura Kelly. I write about foreign policy for The Hill. And I just want to say before I introduce our amazing panel, um, even as the world is facing its 17th year uh, of democratic decline, there is some uh, room for optimism because the number of countries that are experiencing democratic backsliding have gone down. So there were 60 countries that were a bit worrisome in 2021. That number is now 35. So I think, you know, we're, we're going on the right path. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panel. We have first Hardy Merriman. He is the president of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and co-author of the Fostering a Fourth Democratic Wave, or primary author of uh, Fostering a Fourth Democratic Wave, a playbook for countering the author authoritarian threat. Uh, we have Freddy Guevara. Uh, he's a fellow researcher at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard University. He's the former vice president of the Venezuelan parliament, and he was a political prisoner, and he is a uh, political exile. We have also with us uh, Lisbeth Pilligard. She is a member of the board, she's member of the board and chair executive committee, European Endowment for Democracy, and executive director of the Danish Institute for Parties and Democracy. And wonderfully joining us virtually, we have Dan Twining, president of the International Republican Institute. Um, so I'd like to give each of our panelists a few minutes of opening remarks, um, but I'm going to pose a little question. So um, we'll start with, um, with Hardy. Um, I, I want to point out that one, one of the key takeaways I took from the, uh, from the playbook is that it is 90 pages, uh, underscoring that there's no one-size-fits-all response to supporting democratic movements, even as there are some core principles. Um, so can you give us a brief overview of what are the main points um, and what are some new ideas that you and the authors have thought about? Um, and maybe uh, some real world examples. Sure. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to the council for hosting this. I want to echo uh, the thanks that Matt Cranig said in his opening remarks to all the individuals who made this possible. Uh, so many of you uh, have contributed your time and efforts to this, and I really appreciate it. So in this project, um, <clears throat> My co-authors and I make the argument that democracies should do much more to support and create an enabling environment for uh, pro-democracy and human rights movements around the world, particularly nonviolent popular movements, the kinds that we're seeing all over the world with increasing frequency. And we advance sort of a three-pillar strategy to achieve this. And in the first pillar, what we do in the playbook is we sort of survey the variety of forms of external support that can be provided by democracies, but also by international non-governmental organizations, philanthropies, diaspora groups, and look at what the academic research says about what works and what doesn't. We look at pra what practitioners and practitioner insights say about what works and what doesn't, and we develop a framework and principles to help democracies and other external supporters sort of navigate their way through what can be fairly complex, which is figuring out how to support a movement at different stages. And the second pillar, what we do, is we advocate <clears throat> the development of a new norm, which we call the right to assistance. And the right to assistance is grounded in existing international law. And what it says is that when people are organizing nonviolently for democracy or human rights, they have a right to request certain forms of assistance and to receive certain forms of assistance from domestic or international sources. And furthermore, that authoritarians do not have grounds to embargo that right. Sovereign, asserting sovereignty, asserting non-intervention, by itself is not sufficient grounds to embargo certain forms of assistance to human rights defenders and democracy advocates. <clears throat> and then the third pillar, uh, we look at new opportunities for democracies to work together to constrain autocrats, um, and also to drive up the cost of their repression when they're cracking down on movements uh, or their own populations. Um, so, you know, this, this publication comes at a critical time for democracy. As we know, we are amidst a pretty major autocratic wave mm -hmm. that goes back at least for the last 17 years since 2006. And during this time, um, autocrats have become much more brazen in their repression and their attacks on democracies. Um, and also in their collaboration and coordination, they have become much more resilient. 
now when a civil resistance movement uh, domestically pushes for democracy or human rights, autocrats line up to try to make sure that movement fails. They work together. All of them are scared of their own populations. And for this reason, <clears throat> they're terrified of a nonviolent movement achieving democracy anywhere. So they form common cause. They, they <clears throat> you know, provide all kinds of assistance to each other, which we can get into later, um, and have really started to shift the balance in their favor. And now, how we got into this autocratic wave is a long topic, but I will make one observation about it right now, which is for the first seven to 10 years of this autocratic wave, it moved slowly. So autocrats did not seek to shift the momentum from democracy towards autocracy globally in one fell swoop over a few years. They didn't have a short time horizon. They didn't try to do it with just one program. They iteratively, year after year, chipped away at the civic space in their countries and also uh, domestically I and mean, internationally at democracy. And so each year trying to increase their advantage, each year becoming a little more coordinated, a, more, a little more resilient, building their capacities. And so what started slowly after seven to 10 years now moves quite quickly. And I think we have to take a similar lesson in our mindset for how to counter this. I don't think there's any one big solution waiting for us. And I don't think that we're going to see things turn around quickly. I think if we develop the right policies, we absolutely can prevail and make democracy the dominant trend in the world. But it's going to take a multifaceted approach, and it's going to take time. And we need to think in five and 10 year increments here of building our advantages, chipping away at theirs, <clears throat> and, um, and building our capacities to support movements. And one other point um, I'd make is that the research in the report draws on this growing body of knowledge that finds consistently that for the third democratic wave, as well as over the last century, popular nonviolent civil resistance movements have been one of the most powerful drivers of democracy around the world. So these movements exert powerful bottom-up pressure that can complement top-down pressure by democracies. Um, and they use tactics like strikes, boycotts, protests, civil disobedience, and many other acts of non-cooperation. If we are able to expand our repertoire as democracies from predominantly a top-down toolkit to also being much more adept and skillful at working with movements and enabling from the bottom up, uh, I, again, am very confident that we can foster fourth democratic wave, but it's going to take both forms of pressure to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of patience and uh, yeah. waiting for things to uh, putting in the work and then seeing how they evolve, not, uh, not quick fixes. Yep. Um, and now we'll turn to, to Dan Twining. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> um, Dan, uh, please, uh, please tell us about um, you know, the work of the International Republican Institute. But I also wanted to uh, pick your brain on, as we look back 20 years of US involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan, and in particular, the image of US promoting democracy building at times can be a lightning rod for criticism. Given the US failures in Afghanistan and, uh, and the challenges that Iraq faces as it continues to work through its de democracy. And we see Russia and China target the US as part of its propaganda um, to, to say, look, uh, the US, it's another form of colonialism, this democracy building. Um, so how, how has the image of the U.S. as being a promoter of democracy shifted, as well as the strategy? Thanks, Laura. Uh, I'm very sorry to have to be overseas, because otherwise uh, I would 100 percent be there with you all to launch this very important new report. I really appreciate uh, Hardy's and Ash's and Patrick's leadership, as well as that of Matt Kronig at the Atlantic Council and uh, all involved this is really important, uh, perhaps the most important document or one of them to come out of the Summit for Democracy Week that we are in with events uh, all over uh, the world. So, Laura, you've asked me a question, I, you know, in part about something that happened sort of 22 years ago, which was the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11 and then the U.S. invasion of Iraq uh, 20 years ago. This report isn't about that. Uh, the work of IRI, NDI, the National Endowment for Democracy, has nothing to do uh, with that. You know, I think, uh, before moving on to the report, that the big takeaway uh, from Afghanistan and Iraq are uh, the extraordinary instabilities and deprivations of human freedom and human potential that come from the kind of Ba'athist rule that we saw in Iraq and elsewhere in the Arab world that you still see in Syria with its crushing of human possibility, uh, and the medieval rule of the Taliban, which I'm sorry to say is back because we walked away 
So America cannot fix the world's problems. Actually, what's important about this playbook is that we're talking about uh, fundamentally uh, supporting citizens craving freedom around the world in self-help. Uh, they do want our help. Hardy is right. Autocrats are colluding. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin made a statement at the Beijing Olympics just over a year ago, hmm. sketching out a vision of a world in which authoritarianism was on the march, a world that was not safe for democracy or human freedom anywhere. It's really a chilling document that they laid out. Uh, in their summit meeting last week, Laura, uh, there's public uh, video and audio of Xi Jinping saying to Vladimir Putin, you know, the biggest changes in the world in 100 years are happening and we're driving them, right? Uh, I think we're going to look back uh, not at uh, exponentially more years of democratic decline, but at something different, which is that 2022, 2023 are pivot years in which democracies pushed back and small d Democrats around the world demanded their rights and freedoms. So uh, look at China. The biggest protests since Tiananmen Square happened at the end of last year all over the country. Look at Iran. We're in the seventh month of amazing protests again all over the country, uh, peaceful civil disobedience uh, movements. Uh, look at Russia where uh, an enormous number of Russians have either uh, first protested or left their country because they are so uh, fed up with Vladimir Putin's kleptocratic rule and his strategically catastrophic mistake of invading a free and democratic neighbor. So I look at the world, and I think we look at the world from IRI, and we see a world in which authoritarians are actually under enormous pressure at home, and the democratic ideal uh, is surging. That doesn't mean democracy is winning everywhere. I, I don't think we'll ever live in a world uh, that's ever perfectly governed any country, uh, but uh, people are fighting back, demanding their basic rights and liberties. And it really, what's strategic about this report, it, it's not about American interests. Lisbeth is here to explain that. This is really about supporting people who want to build open societies. And my last thought here, Laura, for now, is that we know that where democratic institutions take hold, accountability, transparency, responsive constitutional governance can take hold, that, that solves a whole bunch of other problems, right? Those are the countries that develop into high-income societies. Those are the countries that do not produce refugees and mass migration. In fact, they attract the world's talent. Uh, those are not countries that export violent extremism. And those are not countries who invade uh, and try to swallow democratic neighbors. Mm -hmm. The fundamental security problem for the world is autocracies. And it's, it's far past time for democracies to get our act together and support people who want to build more stable, democratic, open societies all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, now we'll go to, to Lisbeth. Um, can you tell us how, how your work has evolved in the face of uh, growing authoritarianism? And where are some of the places that your organizations are most focused on, on assisting or working with? And what are some of the tools that you have found are most effective? Thank you, Laura. I also want to echo uh, the, uh, the praise from, from Dan to, to, to the authors, to you, Hardy, for, for the, uh, the great work of the, um, of the playbook. Um, I think it's important and timely and I think there are many ways that it can inspire, hopefully, uh, not only the U.S., but broader. And that's, I mean, representing a, a European organization, of course, also our interest that it inspires leaders across. And as we say, autocrats are organizing themselves. They have clubs. We need the democratic countries to, uh, to get more organized and, and be together stronger. So it's a pessimistic background that we are looking into, although, Laura, you said that that there are less countries autocratic uh, or less, but there is actually more. I mean, if we look at the number of people living in autocrat mm -hmm. states, it's an immense. 72% of the world's population live in an autocrat autocratic regime. So it's a lot of people, it's huge countries. So I think the handbook has an appealing case for nonviolent movements, and I, there's a lot of, of your evidence that is built on what happened during the 80s and 90s. And then we've seen some challenges with civil rights, uh, civil movements. Let's hope that, that the inspiration and the lessons learned from, from those decades can be put back on the agenda, because there are many brave people around fighting for rights, but having very difficulties in organizing themselves. Then for the European Endowment for Democracy, um, we have been, uh, we have done, I would say, a lot of what is also recommended in this playbook uh, for states um, 
and that's to be flexible uh, in our funding, to be very, very quick in our funding, and to be able to assist people here and now. I think that's essential if you want to support civil rights uh, movements and and civil dis disobedient movements is that you are you listen to their needs right away and that it's not a funding mechanism. I think you also highlight that in, in the playbook that, that many states have become overly bureaucratic in their democracy support initiatives and that's not helpful. So quick, flexible uh, funding mechanisms uh, is what we do at, at the EED and I hope that will echo uh, broadly. And then I think you have a appealing case for, for including democracy in the foreign policy policies to make democracy the, the prime issue of, of, uh, of how to advance our, our, our countries in general, as, as Dan also says. And before I turn to, to Freddie, I, just to follow up on being flexible on trying to limit bureaucracy, uh, I mean, is it is it possible given the challenges of sometimes uh, of vetting organizations, vetting people, making sure that the money is going to to the right places? Well, at the UN Endowment for Democracy, we've been, we've been very good at making sure that the uh, the people that come to us, uh, activists from from all parts. I mean, mainly the European neighborhood countries and countries uh, neighbors of the neighbors. So, a vast uh, area there. And, and uh, it, it requires, of course, a close uh, relationship uh, to know people, but it's built on trust. And people come to us saying, we need money here and now, we've got a good idea. And we don't uh, drown them in, in requirements of bureaucracy. We listen to their ideas and we believe in them. And we've had very good results in, in, in seeing that happening um, because we also invite new organizations individuals, people who are not formally registered, because they can go many other places, the more traditional organizations. So we support a lot of the movements that are happening in many countries, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, um, Syria, and so on, that all of them work under very, very difficult circumstances. But that's, that's what we can do and others can do and states can do, is to bring hope, uh, not only finances, but also hope for, for, for these movements. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And Freddie, thank you so much for coming. Freddie has traveled here um, from Boston by way of Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela is a particular case in how the parties and the mm -hmm. people fighting to preserve democracy engaged with the international community to push back against Venezuela's autocratic leader, Nicolas Maduro. Um, so, Freddie, can you talk about what are some of the successes of mm -hmm. those efforts um, and how they could be applied to other places? Well, thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation. And for all the uh, great work that all of you do for people like me and societies like Venezuela that really need support from scholars, from experts, and from the international community to achieve basic needs. Um, first, I would like to say that I've dedicated all my youth, youth and adult life to study training, but also practicing civil resistance. But moreover, I come from a place, as you said, Venezuela, that recently, I think that I could say that we have been the nonviolent civil resistance movement that has received the most amount of international support in the last decades. And even though we weren't able to achieve to topple down Nicolas Maduro or regain democracy. And I say this because I really want to remark this. I think this guide, this guide, needs to be taught in every foreign affair, school, human rights, or any program that exists in the world, in the democratic world, because this can be a very important, I would say, asset, a very important contribution for this fourth wave of democracy that Hardy has been telling this. And I'm saying this because I told that to Hardy when he sent me this important invitation and, and the guide. I don't know if any of you does, does this too, but sometimes when I'm reading on something that I think I know, right, I start reading and then I say like, okay, this is important, but then, well, I think this idea is missed. And then in the next paragraph, that idea was there, right? So I, I could see the Venezuelan situation, you know, described perfectly there, and also the things that didn't work out and possible solutions. 
So I will say things that work very well, but I would say, oh, I will also remark things that weren't that well in the international thing, because I am not saying that we're, or our actual situation is responsible for the international community. No, we also have made mistakes and we need things to improve. There's also systemic situations like COVID that happen. But oh, there, there's another, a lot of reasons that uh, are related to the international field, from the bad guys and from the good guys. So the first thing that I would say, a very good, important thing that happened in Venezuela, and, and it's a thing that it's in the art of war and anything in every war theory, you know, you need to to limit the access to resources to your enemy, right? Yeah. In this case, the dictatorships. And we managed to, to do something very important with the support of the United States and European Union to froze accounts of Nicolás Maduro and its regime. And that wasn't only depriving him to use that money for corruption or repression, but we used it also to support democratic structures, for example, we, so we did a program using cryptocurrencies that we use frozen assets from outside from the dictatorship to give direct transfers to nurses and doctors in Venezuela during the COVID pandemic that weren't receiving mm. the, the support from the Maduro regime. And we did it without having to pass through the national bank system, right? But also at the same time, as it would say the second thing that is important, the human rights accountability. I think the work with the fact-finding mission in the United Nations, the work with the Human Rights Commission with Michelle Bachelet, and also the ICC, the International Criminal, Criminal Court case, are very important things that uh, made significant pressure and is still helping us a lot. And the third thing will be the diplomatic thing regarding the withdrawal support. All of these things are things that are very good related in the guide. And it's very important because we were able to, to take away Maduro from very important international spaces, so as the Organization of American States, the Inter-American Development Bank. And we also, for example, here in the United States, we, use, we, we have the, um, the Venezuelan embassy in DC was controlled by the legitimate uh, power in Venezuela chose by the National Department that I'm part of. So those are three things that I think are very important, are related here, but at the same time, are related in a way that also shows what needs to be done in order to be more effective. And I would say, for example, with sanctions. I mean, sanctions can help if they're all multilateral, because, and if they're built in a smart way. You do very, uh, very, you, you don't do much. If you target, uh, you know, some militars or torturers or crooks from Venezuela regime, from Maduro regime, from using their assets in the states, but if they go to Spain and they, you know, they spend their money there and their and their mistress and their crooks partners buy properties in in Le Champs Elysees, okay, yeah, they, they can go to Disney World, but they go to Euro, Euro Disney or they go to other places, right? So one of the problems that we have is that really United States was the only country that actually did economic sanctions. And when I'm saying economic sanctions, not necessarily needs to be in a global scale, but you have, you have sectoral targeted sanctions that build in a smart way can make the dictators and the enablers that are very important to, to, you know, to, to take them away from the dictatorship power uh, to act in a, not, in a good way. So, well, I won't take more time, but I think that uh, I just want to remark that I see a lot of the Venezuelan situation here, and I see a lot of interesting and creative uh, policies, um, recommendations. The, the one that I loved the most was the one about creating an international fund for strikes. Mm. I think that's amazing. You know, if the international democracies could have this fund where uh, public sectors, public workers from around the world in dictatorship could say, okay, we'll go on a strike, but I would not lose my bread. I would not lose the, the, the opportunity to feed my family. Those are things that are very creative. And I think that, you know, with the flexibility, with boldness, with, 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 yeah, with the, the, the thrive to do new things, uh, we can make a, a, a fourth democratic wave. And again, congratulations. I really think as a freedom fighter that this can change the lives of millions of people around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's two big important points of, um, 
of what you said. I mean, you said a lot of good points. I'll just, I'll just pull out two. Um, one about uh, the need for coordination among yeah. democracies to increase the pressure so that you know one action of punishment uh, is just is not futile. Uh, and then the second is um, this idea in the playbook, the right to assist, which can also be a, uh, a bigger force if it is with a um, in a coalition. So maybe let's just start with Hardy on this idea of making this kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, alliance of democracies or coalition of democracies or a formal grouping. Um, and we kind of, maybe if you want to talk about if we kind of see how has that happened with Russia's war in Ukraine um, and among the multitude of multilateral organizations that we have, can any of those be scaled up for this or do we need to start from scratch? Can we throw out some of those multilateral organizations that are maybe taking up resources? And then uh, Dan, Lisbeth, Freddie, if you guys want to jump in too. Great, thank you. Um, yes, we certainly advocate for uh, greater coordination among democracies in one form that could take would be the establishment of a new multilateral body. Um, you know, the, the G7 has advantages and that, you know, the G7 ha can, for example, the, the governments represented there uh, comprise a significant amount of global GDP, but obviously we're thinking of something broader, larger, more inclusive. Um, and the particular form that takes is tricky because how many countries you include, what the criteria for inclusion are, are all things that have to be worked through carefully. So I can't comment on all of that now. But at the core of that is simply we need to collaborate more. And that's something with which we, on, on which I think we all agree. Authoritarians are doing it. We should do it too. And so some sort of low-hanging fruit that could be grounds for collaboration. One would be sanctions, as Freddie mentioned. So there was a study I was reading on the implementation of Magnitsky sanctions by the European Union, the United States, Canada, and the UK. And it found significant divergences in what kind of abuses result in sanctions, what regions of the world are focused on. Are sanctions more focused on individuals or corporate entities? Um, how much civil society input is going into Magnitsky sanctions? I mean, these are all things that could be coordinated. And what it finds <clears throat> is that Multilateral implementation of Magnitsky sanctions, which are critical, only has occurred about 11% of the time. Mm. So here we have this powerful tool, mm -hmm. but it's only really powerful if we work together yeah. to yeah. employ it. And it's cumbersome to continue to figure out who are the entities, what are the cash flows, who do we sanction next? You know, okay, now, now the sanctioned individual or entity is trying to work around. It requires a certain amount of just investigation, intelligence sharing to be able to continue to stay ahead of that. And that's something that just seems like a common, simple thing that democracy should be able to collaborate on, whether it's through an existing body or a new body multilaterally. Uh, may I just ask? Sure. Um, you said they, there's about 11% coordination now. What would you like to see that percentage get to in, in what kind of time frame? <laughs> I, well, I, the math. You know, I'm, I'm careful about staying in my lane, right? So this is about the civil resistance movements, and I don't consider myself a sanctions expert. But mm -hmm. I do look at the way that sanctions impact movements and some of the possibilities for how they could increase. I listen to people like Freddie when they say sanctions matter, but you could do it better. So that's what's going into this recommendation in the mm -hmm. playbook. Mm -hmm. But I think there are people who study sanctions, make a li you know, and that is their expertise, who could speak much more carefully about, about that particular piece. Um, I think there's also room for greater collaboration on investigations of abuses. I would love to see uh, greater warnings that would be, you know, on authoritarians that would be triggered when their repression escalates, that there's sort of more standard warnings. Okay, you've escalated to this point. Now you're going to, now we are going to start investigations. We're going to put X capacity towards that. And I think it's really, in doing that, we have to also think through about the way that repression has changed. So authoritarians, one of the things that they've done very effectively is they've learned how to target repression and to sort of what we call smart repressive tactics. Tactics that don't create an easy visual, right? but that actually still have a significant impact on their population and on, on a movement. So for example, they don't need necessarily to go out and do mass arrests or violence in a protest if they have facial recognition software, can track people, and then just can arrest them in the middle of the night. It doesn't create the same backlash, but the functional effect is the same. 
Similarly, through surveillance, they do all kinds of preemptive repression, trying to prevent a movement from even getting going by simply constraining civic space, cutting off NGO funding, doing all, cutting off freedom of expression, cutting off media. And so these are all ways in which they do repression now that's highly effective, but that doesn't create the visual that sometimes people are waiting for to say, ah, oh, now the repression backfires. Mm -hmm. We need to be much more aggressive about calling that repression out, talking about its functional impact, and also investigating it and figuring out how to sanction it. Um, and so these are, you know, this is another area, I think, where democracies coordinate. Um, I mean, there are others, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop there and let others, <laughs> yeah. Um, can, I, can I add something? And I was thinking if I will say this or not, because it's not a popular opinion nowadays in the United States. And with some peers in, in the, the, where I'm now, now in, in Harvard, this make me not, uh, not, not so popular, but I, I would say, I mean, I understand, of course, that the United States has done uh, bad things, of course, and it's very important that the United States uh, reviews the history of the foreign policy, but at the same time, I will say something. If the rest of the world still let that United States way have the most of the weight in the democratic struggle, we will still be failing because, and I, of course you, you cannot compare the, the amount of money that the United States has as a country to other uh, small European countries, right? But when you review the percentage, for example, of how the United States dedicates money towards helping international uh, democratic movements, and you compare it to other countries, I'm not talking about like the, the net amount, but like percentage, you see that there's a significant difference. And and United States cannot do it alone. Mm. United States need the support for European countries, but also for Latin American countries too, because, okay, yes, we will not expect that, I don't know, countries in Latin America, like Argentina or Colombia can give a lot of money because you have a lot of social issues, but you could share intelligence you could share diplomatic efforts. So what I think sometimes is that, yes, of course, the United States needs to review a lot of the things that they have done internationally. But at the same time, what cannot happen is like, you say like, okay, you know, uh, the police is not working, but nobody else is going to join the police. So I think that it's very important. I will say that in our experience, I think that we really miss the support of the European Union as a whole. You know, and they were like very. Uh, there was a lot of stupid things between the, uh, you know, the anti-American thing and and what the European service, uh, you know, think about it. And, and you get entangled in that's in these geopolitical uh, battles that at the end just hurts the people. And we don't care really if, if Europe is better than the United States. We just know that these guys, Iran, China, um, Russia, they're working together. They're very bold. They send the Wagner Group to protect Maduro. They send, they share technology. And at the same time, then we have discussions like, well, we don't want this to do it because it was made by Trump. Or we don't want this to do it because it was made by Biden. And we, we, we don't care about it. We need support. People are dying. People are in jail. And, and we need that the rest of the world assumes the same strength and the same commitment as the United States, with all the other mistakes. Mm -hmm. But I really prefer mistakes than inaction. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a very important thing that needs to be happening in the rest of the democratic world. Mm. And uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. No, no, I think it's a, a very important point, And I think we all agree that more collaboration should happen. We have a summit happening, and I think many of us have asked for um, a stronger leadership among democracy actors and states. Let's hope that this summit will, uh, will live up to those uh, expectations that not only having a summit itself is not going to solve our, our democratic uh, backsliding uh, globally. So we need leadership among states participating in the summit. Let's hope that that will come. Some of those discussions will happen. Um, the other thing that I wanted to raise is, is supporting uh, uh, movements uh, in country and movements exiled. I think there are some dilemmas there um, and some different approaches that we need to take mm -hmm. uh, when, when, when having that, uh, when that work is being done. And I think states also needs and donors in general needs to think about how they, they can support mm -hmm. both people inside countries struggling and those that were forced to leave and are now 
uh, working uh, and fighting for democracy in exile. Mm. Uh, Dan, was there anything you wanted to, to jump in on? So democracies need to work together, back to your original question, Laura, in so many ways, uh, including just concerting together. You know, we've seen the Quad in Asia, we've seen AUKUS, uh, we've seen NATO enlargement happening here with Finland and Sweden. We've seen the extraordinary Western support for Ukraine, which is uh, a country fighting for its freedom, just fundamentally on the brink. I'm a little surprised it hasn't come up yet. Uh, so uh, the West has been much more unified uh, than it has been. Uh, I think Putin's invasion and assault, really just a historic criminal assault in 2022, 2023, that there is a major war in Europe, uh, that a, quote, great power is leveling European cities and attacking civilian infrastructure in Europe, uh, has shocked many people in the democracies uh, into an awakening and into action. Uh, and I'm with Freddie. I think we all need to work together in every way we can, set domestic politics and uh, other frictions aside, uh, and stand by Ukraine, uh, stand by Taiwan, stand by the people of Burma who are fighting against an illegitimate regime that literally uh, lost an election and then deposed the democratically elected parliament, rules by force, uh, support the people of Venezuela, that fundamentally global instability comes from these autocratic uh, societies. Yep. Uh, that yeah. prey on their own people and prey on their neighbors. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's easy to get down in the weeds, uh, but I think also it's quite important just to step back and really understand what's at stake in the world here. And for, for our colleagues in the audience and otherwise who live in free and open societies, uh, listen to people like Freddie. It's really different to live in a country where something you say uh, could get the secret police knocking at your door and taking you away in the middle of the night. It's really different to live in a country where you cannot worship uh, as you see fit. It's really different to live in a country where you cannot associate with uh, peaceful uh, colleagues peacefully uh, around uh, ideas. And so uh, for all of us who live in free and open societies, it is worth reflecting on uh, what Kanan Makia, uh, back to Iraq, called the Republic of Fear that people in dictatorships uh, live in, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Belarus uh, to uh, Cuba. Uh, we really do have more work to do to help small D Democrats uh, deliver human dignity for citizens, which is literally impossible in an autocracy where the most basic hopes and freedoms are crushed. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is the, uh, you know, all it sounds all well and good, let's unite, let's work together, but inevitably politics harm these efforts or challenge these efforts. But at the same time, this is the strength of democracies that you can have different ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but but Hardy, how, how do you envision kind of this playbook being used by policymakers, um, and how can it transcend partisanship? Hmm. Interesting question. I mean, so far, the playbook has elicited no partisan reaction uh, that's been negative, or it has, I mean, the cause of democracy and supporting it, and why that makes sense, both from our perspective of U.S. values as well as interests, uh, has not been a partisan, it hasn't been partisan with regards to what's in this playbook at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a lot of appeal um, to the idea that, yes, we need to exert greater bottom-up pressure. If top-down pressures were all that was needed, if sanctions, aid, trade, um, diplomacy, and threats of hard power were adequate to turn the autocratic wave, we would have done it by now. So I think there's a lot of openness right now to the idea that we need to expand our toolkit. And at the same time, I want to be careful when I say that, because when I'm talking about civil resistance movements, I'm talking about movements that are driven by indigenous energy. They can't be created or commanded or controlled from the outside. They are driven by people who are fed up with authoritarianism, fed up with corruption, and see a better lives for, them, for themselves in a democratic system that respects their human rights. Um, and these movements are going to keep arising. And the question continually facing us, whether in Iran or Burma or Belarus or Venezuela, is what do we do when they rise up? We can't control the timing. The question is, are we prepared? Mm -hmm. And there's a great opportunity here for us if we'll just see it. We, as democracies, have allies in every country in the world, in their populations. Mm -hmm. there, there are populations in every single authoritarian country that have common interests and that want what we also want for that country. And so, again, you know, the, the idea that 
we should de develop, might be much more sophisticated and strategic and practice solidarity with other democracies in supporting that, I, it seems like common sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Yeah. I May I sure. short? I, I, I promise this I will be shorter. <laughs> if I were Anthony Blinken or Joseph Borrell, I will gather these guys with... What if you were Ron DeSantis? <laughs> what? Ron DeSantis, uh, well, maybe he hasn't uh, announced yet, but he yeah. may be the, uh, or has he, uh, potential presidential candidate for the Republican Party. No, yeah, yeah, I know, but he's Who, not like now in charge like Anthony Blinken from the international uh, policy of the United States or Borrellas as in Europe. But, but, but my point is that about every, I mean, from every party, I would gather these guys and organize a workshop with my senior level officials, but also with all the people from the desks that are related to all the undemocratic societies, Venezuela, Burma, Belarus, all the time. I think that that's a very important thing that needs to be done in Europe and the United States and let the officials that are in charge of this type of design, the design of these policies to have a workshop on this guide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll just ask one, one more question, and then we'll turn to audience for questions. Thank you guys so much. Um, uh, let's talk about the Right to Assist program um, as, as something really practical that's uh, kind of uh, maybe challenging to implement. And, and specifically in Iran, I mean, I think Iranian protesters were crying out for assistance, and there was this fear that um, how that is done can, be, can undermine the movement as a as a as foreign intervention or something like that. So who who would like to start with that? Should we should we give Dan Dan a chance to <laughs> give him a reason to be on? Uh, yeah, I'd be delighted. I'd be delighted. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so the authoritarian playbook today. Let me talk about the authoritarian playbook. Mm -hmm. Is to say, if you're someone like Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin who rules without the consent of your people, uh, that uh, anyone who dissents against you, anyone who has a different political opinion than you, the leader is some kind of foreign agent. Uh, and it's very interesting because uh, we've heard from people all over the world, literally all over the world, including in all of these closed societies, who say, look, they call me a foreign agent, but I'm not getting any foreign support. Uh, I would love foreign support. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have to understand autocracies are intervening in our politics, in our societies, in very meddlesome ways. Uh, if this weren't a public event, I'm sure it would be being surveilled right now by the CCP and the Kremlin. Uh, I've been personally sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party in their efforts to limit my abilities in life. Uh, these countries are intervening in all sorts of nefarious ways. Yeah. I think our point on the right to assistance in closed societies and among uh, democratic uh, civic movements uh, is that uh, we're not interfering. Actually, we're trying to support power being vested in the people, that we fundamentally believe that governments derive authority from their citizens, from the consent of their citizens. And in these closed societies, leaders rule without the consent of their citizens, who are therefore nothing more than subjects. And it's just not acceptable in the 21st century in this modern technological age of wonders that we live in. Uh, for countries uh, like North Korea uh, to be governed the way that they are. So uh, our interest is not in any sort of foreign intervening or meddling, even though the autocracies are doing that very directly to try to divide us amongst ourselves in democracies. Now, our interest is in helping people in these countries around the world make their own choices. Uh, that fundamentally will be a greater source of security and stability and prosperity than any form of strongman rule. Okay. And, and Hardy, and then maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. So if you have a, a question, get ready, and we'll come around with a microphone soon. Sure. I mean, when autocrats um, accuse there being, you know, say ah, a movement, this is evidence of foreign interference. I mean, first consider the source. Consider who's saying that. <laughs> Consider the fact that they are really uncomfortable with freedom of expression and free media, that they most likely regularly lock up journalists, per persecute people, monitor social media, and then, so right there we should say, wait a minute. <laughs> How much do we trust what your accusation is? Number two is obviously the accusation is designed to, to sort of, uh, as a pretext for repression of the movement. So that's their game plan. They've been saying it for years, they've said it for decades. So we can expect that. And then we really have to look <laughs> at where autocrats want to situate human rights. 
they want to turn human rights law into a dead letter. Mm. Because their argument for decades has been sovereignty, non-intervention, everything that I want to embargo and stop can stop because I'm the sovereign. Wait a minute. If you don't allow free and fair elections, how are people supposed to vest their sovereignty in you? Sovereignty resides in the population. Yeah. It's vested in the head of state through regular acts of self-determination where they vest that sovereignty there. Why does an autocrat who hasn't allowed free and fair elections in years allowed to assert sovereignty on behalf of millions, tens of millions, hundreds, or billion, over a billion people, number one. Number two, human rights <laughs> exist regardless of sovereignty. The right to freedom of association it allows people, it's in the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, it's in numerous you know, treaties, human rights instruments, human rights committees have you know, consistently reinforced this. You have the right to form associations to further your interests. And part of that right is the right to receive resources. Uh, the International Center on, um, for Not-for-Profit -for -not Law, uh, UN Special Rapporteur Mina Kiai, and now UN Special Rapporteur Clement Vuhl have all done great work documenting this. I recommend people look at their work. Um, and we as democracies have allowed actually this authoritarian framing way too much to affect our own behavior. The burden of proof is not on us to say why certain forms of support uh, are legitimate. The burden of proof should be on the authoritarian. Why do you have the right? Why do you grant yourself the right? What makes you think it's legitimate to embargo your, to, to violate your own country's, your own population's human rights? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Did you want to add anything, Elizabeth? We'll go, go to questions to the audience. Okay, would somebody like to ask a question? Oh, okay. Well, uh, well maybe we'll take some questions from... Uh, from our wonderful uh, virtual audience. Um, this is from Jack Krupansky, uh, and he asks, is regime change considered as part of this new playbook? Uh, Freddie, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to monopolize, but I wrote the book. <laughs> He's one of the authors. I mean, uh, a policy of supporting civil resistance movements. Again, these are nonviolent movements using strikes, boycotts, protests, acts of non-cooperation. That's a policy of human rights support. That's a policy of democracy support. People have the right to employ those tactics, which are protected, many of which are protected under international human rights law for purposes that they, that they determine. If people determine after years and years of misrule, corruption, and abuse, and authoritarianism that they need a fundamental change in their government because there are no institutional options. Elections, the legal system are broken. Who are we to say, you can't do that? We're, we support their right to determine their aspirations. Yeah. And I would also point out that frequently, um, frequently what starts as demands for reforms, an end to corruption, or basic reforms in the security services and policing, or the economy, or gender, or gender equality, or other points, are met with repression. And when those are met so consistently with repression, people start to advocate for a change of government. In this regard, when a movement advocates for a change of government to a democracy, it's also the, the authoritarian themselves that has driven them to this point. They've also made their decision. I'm going to cut off any other way for you to get there. And so I see it as a human rights policy, totally stand by it, and stand by the rights of people to be able to decide what they're going to use their nonviolent tactics to achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hopefully through uh, democratic elections, right. yeah. there might be a, a change. That's yeah. what happens. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. when people yeah. make up their own decisions, and that's what they dream about in Belarus. That's what happened in Maidan in Ukraine. There was a change because mm -hmm. people wanted a change. And I, I talked about this with, with Freddie um, about the, um, the support needed to help people defect as um, to go to the side of protesters. Can you guys talk a little bit about that, about maybe how the playbook um, can, can encourage um, how the, the people running the democratic movement can influence uh, the people in power to, to start to dismantle the pillars that support the authoritarian? Uh, well, no, I would just say that there's a big, th th that's an important thing understanding in, in understanding the civil resistance movements or the strategy in general. That more important even than gathering millions of people in the streets, 
is defections, because that's what really makes a democratic transition. So I would say that there are two, two recommendations that are in this guide that are very important, and I think that we didn't have it in Venezuela. First, intelligence, right? Intelligence. Because you need to know, you know, not only who they are, but also what are their interests, who are their, you know, their economic supporters, who are their uh, families and friends, who, you know, the network that they have. And it's not very, use, you, 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 it's not very common that you as a civil resistor or democratic or politician from the democratic side can have access to, that, to, to the people that are in the regime because autocratic regimes wants to separate societies and they want to create like these small clusters where their elites live in a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't have engaged with the people. But international community can have that kind of information and can help on that. And the second thing is that ties, we were talking about that before in the, in the other room, how also international governments can use their public officials to gather and to bridge you know, the communication and send message back and forth with possible defectors. Mm -hmm. And you can do it with the militaries, but also with judges, but also with any other type of enablers that um, sustains the power of the dictator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this is one of the parts of the playbook um, that stood out to me is bringing in the Department of Defense, bringing in defense officials as conduits for, for messages for maybe some exertion of some pressure uh, on autocratic regimes um, that are facing a, a democratic movement. Um, Hardy, wh why don't you dig into that a little bit more? And, um, and Lisbeth, maybe if you want to comment on what are some of the, the opportunities and challenges. Sure, thanks. Um, I want to say one thing about defections first as well, which is in the playbook, we outline five different stages of movement support. There's the pre-organizing support that starts before there's even a movement. Then there's peak support that's, that happens when a movement is having peak mobilization. Then there's what we call protracted struggle support, which is when the peak mobilization dies down, and then there's a period of time, sometimes years, where there's ongoing sort of contention. Then there's pre-transition support if they're going to get to an election, because the goal, again, of civil resistance is to get institutions to work again mm -hmm. when they start by not working. And then there's post-transition support. And so when you start to look at defect for defections, you might look for it sort of at peak mobilization or you know, at um, pre-transition you know, later on. But a lot of the work on actually creating defections happens in the pre-organizing phase. It's setting the conditions right for the movement to be able to adapt and be ready to present itself as actually a way out of the chaos of authoritarianism, as a way to actually say, we represent for order and democratic change. And if you defect to us, you're actually safer. Your prospects are better with us than with the other side. But that, the process of developing that message and thinking about it starts before you often even see a protest. Or it, it's best, its chances of success are best in the early phases to start thinking that through. Sorry, and your, and your next question was? Well, I think we're, we're just about one Oh, one military, minute. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the point was made. Um, uh, you, with credit to Admiral Dennis Blair, that um, one way in which democratic militaries might be able to exert influence is to get training and understanding in how their authoritarian counterparts are thinking about their job. What are their hidden sources of dissatisfaction that they won't tell you, but that they in fact may have? And how do you talk to them? What is your speech as an officer? not just perhaps in a military, but as Elizabeth has pointed out, across any sector of government, I mean, you're, when you're interacting with a counterpart in an authoritarian setting, what is your speech for why it's better to, to serve in a democracy? Can you speak to what some of their hidden frustrations may be? And not in a manner of giving a speech. I said speech. I meant being able to weave it into the conversation, because we have so many points of contact, both formal and informal, with counterparts in authoritarian societies. These should be leveraged. We should know who has relationships with who. So at critical moments, for example, uh, at a moment of peak mobilization, someone who has a relationship with an officer in that country could call them and say, you know, is this really what you want to do? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, think about, think about your, the path forward if you continue to follow orders. So this is another form of pressure that democracies can exert if we put effort into doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Elizabeth, did you want to add anything? Well, I think the uh, the peer to peer contact across countries is uh, important and a tool that has been used and could could be expanded not only between military, uh, but other other sectors as well. And then I just wanted to point at where we probably missed an opportunity in the Sahel. I mean, Mali, Burkina Faso, where young people went to the streets uh, and wanting the military to take over their country. Uh, fighting against corrupt political leaders. There, I mean, for colonial history and all, I mean, we, we missed an opportunity where young people looked to the military for change. Mm. So there are, there are some uh, definitely there. It could probably be helpful that, that there had been more engagement and hopefully there could be that in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we've just about reached the end of our time. Am I correct? Uh, we could go on, but you know, <laughs> I guess there's lots of stuff to do. There's lots of uh, you know things happening around the world. Uh, but thank you all so much, Dan. Thank you so much for for uh, coming in virtually. Thank you all for joining us in person, online, and uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council. And uh, congratulations and uh, fostering fourth democratic wave. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.